What is the Catholic view of investing? Is there certain areas that a Catholic should invest in? Is it even moral to invest? We're going to talk about those topics today on Crisis Point. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. I want to encourage everybody first to subscribe and like the channel, wherever you listen to it, wherever you watch it. Uh, also follow us on all the different social media platforms at Crisis Mag. Uh, I'd also request, if you could, we're talking about money today, so if you have any extra, you can donate to Crisis Magazine. Just go to crisismagazine.com slash support. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Today, our guest is Andrew Flattery. He is a certified financial planner and owner of Simple Wealth Planning in North Kansas, North Kansas City, Missouri. He's a creator and host of the Reformed Financial Advisor podcast and a member of the Catholic Financial Planners Network. Welcome to the program, Andy. Eric, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, the Crisis Point podcast has become one of my favorite podcasts, and it's sort of like you're my voice of reason and <laughs> the guy that provides practical tips uh, for me on how I can deal with the clown world. So I um, really appreciate you having me on. Good. I, I, that's great. I, I appreciate you saying that. Okay, my first question has to be, so you're Catholic, but your podcast is called the Reformed Financial Advisor Podcast. What were you, a Calvinist or something? <laughs> Where did you, know what? Come from? you are the only person that's going to challenge me on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there's a great, um, there's a great, uh, there's someone that I have sort of a kinship with um, named Josh Brown, who, who's a, a guy on Wall Street and uh, he's on like Twitter and he's got a pod, he's probably got the biggest financial advisor podcast and he, he's the Reformed Broker. Okay. Um, and the shtick was that, you know, he was a stockbroker in a boiler room years ago and saw the light and now he's the reform broker. And, and, and my shtick is sort of like, um, yes, the stockbrokers were, were wrong. The boiler rooms were wrong. That's not how you treat people. But, but there's also a lot to be critiqued about just sort of like traditional financial advice in general, um, where like the, the sort of financial planner down the street, the RA down the street, there's things you can critique about that sort of advice as well, too. So, so I'm the reformed financial advisor, but I'm definitely um, a devout Catholic, Eric. So I appreciate you calling me out on that. Yeah, exactly. I want to make sure you weren't like sliding something, maybe going into yeah. Calvinism or something like that. So, but yes, so Andy is Catholic. So we can't talk about mm -hmm. Catholic stuff here. So uh, now the first thing I want to do is just ask at a very high level. So a lot of people who watch or listen to this podcast know I have some kids who go to Franciscan University of Steubenville. And recently they had a debate on campus. My daughter's actually the president of the debate club. They had a debate where the question was, is it moral for Catholics to invest in the stock market? And I asked her, I said, are re people really actually debating this? She said, oh, yeah, there's definitely a, a lot of people doing that. So I think we should just start with that. Is it moral for Catholics, maybe not even specifically just the, the stock market, but just investing in general? Is that something Catholics can do or is that somehow violating maybe the old rules against usury or something like mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Uh, uh, and props to your daughter for initiating that dialogue, because um, I I don't know about you, but like I get a lot of questions about this. And I think, um, you know, I don't know if it's like a, a conservative thing, like I'm a conservative and, you know, we sort of like to rage about the modern world. So maybe this is one of the things that, you know, we conservatives like to rage about. But I think you know, maybe the best place to start is like just from sort of like first principles or like foundational ideas about what investing is and what sort of service it provides to society. Um, one of the stories I like to tell or one of the ideas I like to think about is that classic essay that a lot of people have heard about called I Pencil from the 1950s. And uh, you've probably heard this story, even if you've never read the essay, but it's this short essay of a pencil um, telling the story of of its existence. So like how this pencil came to be. And it's like, you know, it's sort of like the GK Chesterton quote. Um, we are, we lack wonder, but we are, we are not, we do not lack wonders. So we lack wonder, but we don't lack wonders. But because if you think about it, you know, something as pedestrian as a pencil um, is actually a pretty amazing thing that we can, you know, acquire something like this for like under a dollar at the local general store. When really, um, as the essay points out, there's actually nobody that knows how to make a pencil. There's not one person that knows how to make this little device that consists of, you know, wood, graphite, um, a piece of metal, those little pink things that um, we use to as, as an eraser, maybe a stamp. And the essay goes into like, you know, let's talk about the, the, the wood, for example. Well, you need a logging industry. You need someone to cut down the trees. You're going to require um, someone to create the saws 
and someone to create the heavy machinery, the, the trucks to get the trees out of the forest. Um, you're going to need a factory to manufacture the rubber that makes those that that that, that goes on the trucks and so on and so forth. And the reality is even something like the logging industry requires hundreds and even thousands of actors to make that possible. And, and, and dare I say hundreds and thousands of investors to um, basically allocate the capital to those specific businesses. And so the long and the short of it is, Eric, like if you and I, well, I don't know about you, maybe, maybe you do know how, but, but if I tried to create a pencil and like I tried to YouTube it and like, you know, find, cut down the tree, um, you know, uh, finish the wood and like try to co concoct some sort of um, rubber um, eraser, like it would take me months. It would take me a ton of time and money. And the reality is um, I would have a worse version of the pencil than something I could buy for 50 cents. And so, um, you know, the, S the essay doesn't point this out explicitly, but the way that I think about investing in this sense is that at every step along the way, you need capital allocators that are designating resources to this very various entities in the appropriate pro proportion and, and like in the reasonable proportion. And that's where individual actors, you know, making these small investments um, is a really important thing. And so just if you like, um, if you like energy, if you like warming your house, um, if you have ever had, my, my wife's an oncology nurse, if you have ever had someone get cancer treatment, um, if you, um, you know, if you like listening to the Crisis Point podcast, well, each one of these uh, products and solutions that we enjoy having in, in our modern world requires capital. Um, and, and the investors are the ones that allocate that capital. And so that, that's kind of how I would start the conversation. Yeah. And I think iPencil is a classic because it really does show what goes into making something so simple. It's a great it's used as a pencil because that's something all of us can just pick up for, like you said, for less than a dollar to store. But we could never make it ourselves, not in the sense that not as good as we, we have for I mean, it take a lot of work to do it. And, and it's because each individual industry, like you're saying, we're putting capital into it because somebody decided, OK, I can support my family by start start a logging company. Another person said, OK, I can help. I can support my family. I can make a profit by starting a graphite company. Another one, wherever you use to make a, the eraser. And then somebody said, you know, I can make money by putting all this together, by actually creating a pencil from all these resources that I'm getting from other people. And so that all comes together. But in every single case, people are investing in every single one of those companies. It might be the person just investing in their own company. And that's where I think I think that's a good example where people nobody seems to have a problem with investing in your own company. Like if I say I want to start up a company and I'm going to put my own capital into it, my own time, sweat and my money into it. I don't think any Catholic would say something's wrong with that. In fact, they'd probably encourage it. But if I say, OK, I'm going to give my neighbor ten thousand dollars to help him start his company. And then I'll, I'll share in the profits of that most people are like, okay, that seems okay. But mm -hmm. then you take a step to, okay, I'm going to give, I'm going to pay a hundred dollars for a stock in this P and G or IBM or something like that. Then all of a sudden, somehow that seems to be not as legitimate. And I think some of it has to do with, I know some of the arguments are against that you're not working for it. I guess when you're giving your neighbor $10,000, you're not working for that either. If you're, let's say you're a silent investor, not involved in it. So what is the morality? Is there, is there any moral problems that you can see with this idea of you make, you, you put your money to work. So your money is making money without passive investing is what we're really talking about or without you doing anything. I know some people have argued that that's basically usury or some form of it. So how would you, how would you argue against mm. that? Yeah, I mean, that's 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 so interesting. And, and, and I don't know about you, like I've only been hearing these arguments, you know, really just in the last couple of years, because yeah, me, too. You know, me, me kind of talking about eye pencil, like that seems sort of obvious. Um, but let me let me take a crack at, at, at it. Um, so. So, um, yeah, like like you said, we um, we can all understand the idea. In fact, you know, maybe this is the place you should start, like investing in your own business or investing in a business in your local community. I don't think anyone has a problem with that. Um, but let's talk about, you know, the broader sense of investing or the investing that the general public, you know, deals with today with things like, um, you know, their, their IRA or their 401k, for example. Well, for, for starters, any, anytime you put your hard earned capital to work in, in an enterprise, you are putting your capital to risk. So, of course, 
um, you have the chance of that capital um, of losing your principal entirely. And so um, it makes sense that there, you know, if that business is successful, you should, you should see a return on your investment. We can use logic and reason to come to that conclusion. Um, and, and also there is something, uh, there was something um, worthwhile about the idea of having a low time preference. So if you are willing to um, not consume today so that you can invest in an enterprise that may or may not pan out, and you actually will never receive any benefit from that for you know maybe years down the road, maybe five, 10, 20 years in some, in some instances. Well, it makes sense that having that patience, having that low time preference, um, if done correctly and, and done prudently should result in some sort of return. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any problem with it because you are taking the risk. You are having the low time preference to wait for this, this enterprise to um, come to fruition. So um, to me, like I, not only do I think it's not immoral, like I think it's a very good thing. Like we want these sort of actors in our world that are providing useful, useful products and services for us. Right. Because the, the time preference issue, I think, is a big one when it comes to investing and understanding. And I know a lot of debates about usury in the Catholic mm -hmm. world revolve around this, too. I think it's a misunderstanding of time preference, because as you're saying, so I give ten thousand dollars to my my neighbor to start a business. Well, that's ten thousand dollars I had. I no longer have access to. Mm -hmm. And not only do I not have access to it, like you said, I could lose every dime of it. I'm putting it at risk. But I'm also saying I, I'm willing to part with that for now when I could buy something right now. And with inflation, of course, you add inflation to the mix. That ten thousand dollars in a year, in five years, ten years, is actually worth less than ten thousand dollars. If somebody said, if I said to my neighbor, or my, I'm sorry, if my neighbor said to me, "Hey, give me ten thousand dollars, and I promise in ten years I'll give you your ten thousand dollars back," who would take that? Nobody would, because first of all, inflation, but also time preference. Just I could do something else with that ten thousand dollars now. That I couldn't, you know, that and so waiting 10 years to just get that back doesn't make any sense. So there's the risk involved and the fact that your money made money in that situation. I think it's just a reflection of the, the whole time preference issue you mentioned. Now, so so I think I, I think you know we could go really down deep into that whole situation, but I know another big argument that Catholics, and this one I think is has a lot more weight to it, in my opinion, modern Catholics have with like investing in the stock market is a lot of these companies don't do good things with their money. I mean, even a company as solid, okay, I live in Cincinnati. And so P&G, Procter & Gamble is the big one for us. Everybody, you know, mm -hmm. their headquarters are here. You know, I know tons of people, I know, I, I know people who work there, stuff like that. They do a lot of stuff like, for example, pushing the gay agenda and, and, and stuff like that. Even a, a kind of Midwestern company like that. We're not even talking about the more extreme, like obviously invest in Playboy or Planned Parenthood. We're talking about just Procter & Gamble. They're using the money they're, they're, as a company. They're using their profits at times to support things that are contrary to Catholic faith. What would you say to a Catholic about investing in stock market who is worried about that situation, about giving their money to companies that are doing terrible things like that? Yeah, I mean, I I, I saw you said something on Twitter about um, just Disney, right? Like, I, I don't know about you. Like, I don't want to own shares in, in Disney right now. Um, yeah. That's just not something that I, I want to put my capital to work with for. Um, and so, like, I, I don't know, like, I think we can use our our best judgment and we can use our formation to try to, um, you know, parse the good from the bad, because, you know, there's a lot of problems with, you know, a lot of these large businesses that we would want to potentially invest in. And, um, and, and so I would say, like, that's maybe that's part of it. Maybe it's just, a, a, you know, the idea is that you want to buy things that you believe in and you want to not buy the things that you don't believe in and, and use your best judgment to, um, to make that call. But I also don't, I, I also, I don't know, I'm not a theologian, but I, I wonder how much moral culpability there is if you're like unclear about what's happening at some sort of, um, you know, conglomerate like that, or if you're unclear, clear about the 3% allocation to your index fund that, um, is in maybe a business like Disney that we wouldn't want to put money in. And because of fiat inflation, we're sort of pushed in to some of these products that we don't understand. Um, we sort of have to, um, to do this to some extent to preserve our purchasing power. So I don't know that there would be a lot of moral culpability, but just, you know, me as like a regular guy, the, the way that I sort of answer that question is just through stock picking. Like I, 
like me personally, um, this is sort of a heretical thing in financial advice, but like, I still like to pick stocks. Um, I like to follow other investors that are still like old school stock pickers. And to me, like that allows me to have more of my hands on the business, uh, to have an idea of who the owners and the operators are. And if I see something I don't like, I just won't buy the company. I'll screen it out of my portfolio. So that's been sort of like the everyman way that I've handled it. Yeah. And that, that's interesting because back uh, my, after my first, my first job in the nineties, we had a, a 401k plan. Mm -hmm. And then when I left it, I, I rolled it over to an IRA and it was just a, some type of fund, I, some mutual fund. I can't remember what it was, but some mutual fund. Well, I, I would get the reports on a regular basis, like the quarterly reports, whatever. And I noticed all of a sudden they started investing in Playboy. And so mm -hmm. I wrote to him and I said, Hey, I don't think you should, I'm, a, I'm an investor. I own this mutual fund. I had a tiny little bit, but I'm like, Hey, might as well. I am, I am one of their investors. I said, I, you know, I, I want you to pull out of Playboy. And they, they wrote back and just give a standard response. No, we think it's good, financially, yeah. whatever. So I, I, at that moment, I decided I'm never going personally. I was like, I'm never getting a mutual fund again. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I just, I did stock picking as, as well. And like for me, I'm no expert or anything like that. I just would pick, I picked some, ones that I, that were like just safe and just held them forever. And, and, but then sometimes every once I find out those companies, they do some bad stuff. Right. And so the morality of it, I do think there's some, uh, I don't necessarily know if it's a sin always, especially if you're not, if you're not aware of it and you've mm -hmm. done your due diligence, but you're not aware of it, obviously that wouldn't be a sin. Um, but I do think there's, there is that issue. And I think one way to get around that is simply don't invest in those companies uh, you know, don't invest in mutual funds, which does make it more difficult because we're not, we're not, you know, who can spend the time who's not a professional like you right. in knowing which these stocks are. Uh, and I want to also bring up, I want to talk, you brought up the whole idea that we're getting forced into this investment because of fiat inflation. I want to talk about that in a minute. But let me take a step back for a second and say there's a lot of criticisms among Catholics about capitalism. And they say, see what, what capitalism does. There's this idea that there's like a third way, a Catholic way. There's socialism, which, you know, yes, that's terrible. And there's Catholic, Catholic uh, I'm sorry, capitalism which in some circles is considered just as terrible. And they say, to prove that point, look at our world right now. And we have, and we do have a lot of corruption. We have a lot of uh, cases of, of big companies, private companies who are doing terrible things like with big tech and media and all these companies who are really pushing agendas and they're almost arms of the government with, while still being private. Uh, we have this idea that that money is the most important thing and there's a destruction of, of small towns, of local mm -hmm. towns like that. And that's all put at the feet of capitalism. Now, would you I, I'm assuming you would probably argue for capitalism. <laughs> and if that's the case, how would you argue from a Catholic perspective why capitalism isn't to blame here or if it is to blame, why it's still the best play or whatever? I, what's your defense of capitalism in general? Yeah, I mean, I think with with all these things, we always need to define our terms because, um, yeah, certainly I, um, as I pointed out with this I pencil idea, like in its purest form, like of course, like I think capitalism is the thing that gets pencils in in my pocket, right? Um, and um, you know, or another way of saying this is like the the free markets or like the the voluntary economy, uh, and and the way that I think about it is. Um, like uh, the idea that private property is um, a very important thing and I should be able to do, I should be able to use my private property for those things that provide for my family and, and those things that I think are worthwhile for society. And so um, that's what I think capitalism is. And um, I think one of the, the, the things that I like to critique with the modern economy is, you know, something like the, the monetary system where money itself is planned from a, a, the top down level. And so like here, you know, in the modern ages, we have like central banks or in the US, we have the Federal Reserve, which is a sort of central bank. And, and that's actually the opposite of capitalism. That's not, that's not capitalism. That's not a free market at all. It's actually, um, you know, maybe the most important um, unit of exchange in our economy is is not a free market but it's in fact it's central actors that are closely aligned with the government making these choices and so i think i would agree probably with a lot of these critics that are cr critiquing cap capitalism in a lot of ways but i think what what i would say is like a lot of the problems come from the central planning of the money whereas they might say it's capitalism um and um and that's how i would parse through that yeah, and I think that that's a great point that you make about the, the terms. I, I found that I normally will say I support the free market yeah. rather than capitalism because 
the term free market's just a little easier to define it. Basically, we're just advocating for a voluntary exchange yeah. of goods between people that we're not forcing anybody to buy anything or sell anything they don't want to. We're not forcing anybody to do anything. We're just letting people freely choose what they do with their own capital. Whereas capitalism, as it's being used today, typically what they mean is the American economy, economic system. Mm. But I would say I would argue I'd remind people that the most regulated place, government regulated place on earth, or at least in America, is Wall Street. I mean, they're controlled completely what they can and can't do. And like you said, the money itself that we have is controlled is, is from the top down. There is no free market when it comes to money. A true free market would include, hey, you can use whatever you want for money if people will accept it. If I want to if I say to you, hey, I'll give you a cow. If you give me maybe, uh, you know, if you build a barn for me and you want to do that, there's nothing wrong with that. that that's, totally, that's, you know, of course, a barter system. But if I say I got these uh, you know, shells from from the beach, I'll pay you in those. And you say, yeah, I'll take that as long as you're voluntarily accepting it and I'm voluntarily giving it. There's no, no reason for that. But what happens is now we have to use dollars. We absolutely have to, you know, pay our taxes dollars, but we basically have to use dollars and, and places that that sell things have to accept dollars, no matter what the inflation does with it. Um, so I, I really think that's a um, I, I think that's a great point, though, that that what we have, I, I usually call it crony capitalism, just to, right. to, to suggest that, listen, this isn't exactly pure capitalism that we're living under. Um, you, you worry, you start sounding like the people say, well, it's not really socialism uh, <laughs> or something like that. But I, I think that's definitely um, part of it. Now, we move to let's talk then about like actually invest. Now, first of all, before we move in this part about investing, I don't know what the official disclaimer should be, but this is not financial advice. This is our opinion. So you you do your own research, listener, and and decide for yourself. And uh, you know, Andy is a professional, but he's not giving he's not sitting down with you for a professional session here. He's just giving his own opinions about about these things. But you mentioned about how fiat inflation is forcing us to things like the stock market. What do you mean by that when, when, you, when you say that? Yeah. Okay, so the uh, the big red pill that I had on this um, actually came from a Catholic. So there's a, there's a Catholic uh, economist, his name's Guido Holzman. Eric, I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, I think he sits on like the Vatican's um, Pontifical Academy for Life or something like that. But he is a student of um, like a 14th century French bishop named... Nicholas Oresme. And at the time, you know, centuries ago, this, uh, this Bishop Nicholas Oresme was critiquing um, the, the medieval princes inflating the money. Um, and so in those days, it was things like clipping the coins, where you would confiscate the coins with your stamp on it, and you would clip them, you would clip the edges and send them back into circulation, or you would melt them down and put base metals into the, into the, into the coins so they weren't as pure of gold as they used to be. And this causes inflation because essentially what you're doing is these princes were creating wealth for themselves by skimming a little bit off of the top. And so um, this is a moral. And in fact, in, in Guido Holzman's book, The Eth Ethics of Money Production, um, he actually says inflation is, is worse than usury. And Resume thought that inflation was a greater sin um, than usury. Um, and so I actually have a quote here that, Eric, if you don't mind, I want to read sure. from, from Holzman. Uh, and it's, quote, Aresme, again, this is the, the 14th century French bishop, Aresme argued that counterfeiting, and here counterfeiting we can think of as inflation. He's using these, these terms interchangeably. Um, the prince is inflating the money or, or, or counterfeiting the money. Uh, was a far more serious moral offense than the sins that are most frequently associated with the use of money, namely money changing and usury. Uh, money changing and usury might be tolerable under certain cer special circumstances, but counterfeiting wasn't un inherently unjust and therefore never permissible. Alterations of legal tender money were, quote, quite specially against nature, end quote. And they are far more worse than usury because usury at least springs from the voluntary agreement between a debtor and a creditor, whereas alterations are done without such an agreement. Um, so that, that's from Guido Holzman. And so, so the point is, like, if we just had money that we could save, like in the case of uh, you know, the, the Middle Ages, maybe it was like the, um, the, the floor and the gold floor and the coins that you would literally haul around on your person. Um, you could literally just save money and there would be no requirement for you to um, speculate in something like the stock market to just pr preserve your purchasing power. And so by preserve your purchasing power, I mean um, 
be able to buy a similar amount of, of, of a basket of goods today that you were able to buy a year ago with the, with the same money, which is not the case um, with, with fiat money, where you know essentially the money that we save in our bank accounts today are a melting ice cube. And so that's what I'm referring to with inflation. Um, really over the last 100 years, um, we've had fiat, fiat infl uh, an inflationary environment here in the United States. And this has been amplified by a couple of different things, by the, the exit of the gold standard in the 1970s. Um, and then in particular, um, just in, even in the last couple of years, um, the, 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 the debt that's been um, brought into our economy today by essentially the money printing mechanism has even caused even more inflation. So I think, you know, this, this trend that we've seen for, very, for decades now, I think, you know, people are starting to wake up to it because they've just seen it with the money that they're saving in the, even in the last couple of years. And so that's what I'm referring to. So what do you do? OK, so so, Eric, as you started you know, talking about the thing, the, the rational thing to do then is, of course, to not hold money at all. And you should get rid of it as soon as possible. And so you might want to buy something. You might want to buy goods uh, or you might want to invest um, because, of course, in investments um, tend to keep up with inflation in time, especially like something like the stock market. Um, you know, it used to be the bond market would even keep up with inflation, but actually that has broken now and that's not the case anymore. Or, you know, something like real goods like gold, silver, and now even Bitcoin are things that like rationally speaking, people are putting their money in because frankly, they have to look for alternatives to saving money. And so like, I don't, I'm not super, um, you know, on the one hand, I love this idea of investing, but I'm not super jazzed about everyone being forced to do it. Like my, my deceased grandmother, who was the, you know, the farmer um, in, uh, you know, in during the Great Depression where they lost the farm, she would have thought it insane that, you know, now everyone is required to invest in the stock market. You know, she was the little old lady that had cash underneath her mattress when um, when she when she died. And so um, that's what I mean. We're, we're, we're sort of forced into these things that we wouldn't normally do. That's not to say there's anything wrong with anybody individually doing it, but it seems unjust that everyone is required to do it. Right. I, I think that's a great point is it, it's unjust that people are required to do it. Like my, for example, my, my mother who, who's a widow now and she's uh, elderly and I, I help take care of her money for her. She's yeah. always, she's kind of, it's kind of funny, but she, she often complains about the fact that the money she has in her, uh, you know, the checking account, however, in the bank, even her money market account, it makes something like 0.01% yeah. interest, something like that. And she's just like, this is nothing. And I, and I tell her, I said, I know. And she wants to know like, Hey, Eric, can we, can we make some more money? And I'm always like, well, to be honest at your age, I try to be delicate about that, yeah. but you don't want to be anything too risky. Anything that's going to be too high of a return is probably going to be too risky for you because of the fact that you have a shorter time frame. Again, try to say it delicately, but at, or at the same time though, I'm thinking, but yet you're losing money. You're literally, you're, 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 your money, you're losing money by having it at the bank because if inflation officially is like, what is it, 7.9%, which is just a farce. It's clearly over 10 at this point. I agree. And so if if, if you're, you're, the value of your money is going down by that much and you're only making 0.1% or 0 0.0 whatever, then you're clearly losing money. So it's forcing people like that to think about investing, which is that that's really where I think the injustice is because somebody like my mom, who my dad was super good with money as far as like very conservative with it, always didn't didn't spend a lot, saved his money, stuff like that. But he saved it in these traditional vehicles like a savings account or something like that. And so he did all the right things. And then it, it's just not going to work out now. And also think I, I was going to say is that I don't think people realize how it should be normal that you should be able to keep your money under your bed, for example, and 10 years later, it should buy you the same amount that it bought you when you put it under. Of course, we think that's crazy now, but that really is actually the normal, a, a, a good economy, a healthy economy. That's you could do that. Um, it would be worth the same now. OK, so I think like my my opinion is I want I want to run this by you as a professional and tell me what you think about this. Like I think with this high inflation. That the smart thing to do with your money, like you said, you don't want to hold on to money because it's just, it's, it's disappearing in front of you. I feel like the best thing to do is invest in real assets because those things will, will keep their value the best. By real assets, I mean things like real estate, 
you know, precious metals, like you mentioned Bitcoin. I, I'm not going to get into the whole Bitcoin debate on this podcast I've talked about before, but we're just going to assume for the purpose right. of this podcast that Bitcoin is a real asset. So just deal with it, listeners. <laughs> um, but things like that, because it seems to me that those things would hold value, whereas even a stock, like even a company may or may not, uh, definitely buying something's not like buying a car. That's although cars lately have been crazy in their values, but buying something that depreciates like that isn't as as smart. So what say you as the professional to that type of kind of attitude? Yeah, I agree. Um, the classic inflation hedge is real goods. And so now you're seeing like all the commodity bulls come out, whereas like, you know, the commodity bulls during the last decade have been, um, you know, they've been yelling at, they've been yelling at nobody because, um, you know, a lot of these things have just been out of favor for a very long time. So I think there's good reason to think that, to think that like real goods, which are like the one, asset class that hasn't done anything over the last, you know, really since 2008 financial crisis are probably um, have a good risk return trade off right now. And so, you know, for example, like in, in our client portfolios, whereas we used to have like a, a bond allocation for clients, we we've taken out a slice of that bond allocation and we've allocated it towards gold and silver, which of course has plenty of, of volatility to it. So it's not like a perfect, um, you know, it's not a perfect solution for grandma, for example, but, you know, gold is one of those assets that it's very hard to create more of it. It has a sort of a low stock to flow. Um, and so this is one of these things where, um, you know, during these inflationary environments, you do see like real goods do well. And yeah, look at look at my house, like the house that I, that I own today um, gets worse every year. But the um, but the value of it keeps going up exponentially, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, and, um, and the reason for that is like what you just pointed out is of course, inflation. Um, there's other reasons too, right? Like it's because of regular regulations and like local zoning laws and stuff for like, maybe there's just not enough supply. Um, but actually, you know, the, the rational thing to do if we are going to continue to have inflation, I think we probably will, um, is actually, um, of course, it's always a good thing to have a paid off house, but, but technically speaking, like having a mortgage, to um, to own a home is actually a pretty good trade off, you know, with rates being really low um, and inflation going going sort of nuts. Um, that's a pretty good trade, um, even though your house gets worse every year, the value of it is going to go up. And so, you know, it, it's not something that I like I'm advising everyone to do. Like I, I work with a lot of young Catholic families that get excited about paying off the house. And I think having a paid off house provides a lot of financial freedom. It can allow you to live more simply and, and more easily on one income. So I think that's a good solution. But on the other hand, like it is a conversation right now, like maybe you, maybe you have a mortgage in a hyper inflate or not a hyper, but just a normal sort of inflationary environment. Um, Cause frankly, that's what the U S government's doing. Like they're, they're not paying off the debt. In fact, they're taking on more debt and they're attempting to sort of inflate the debt away. That's probably what I'm going to be seeing throughout the rest of my lifetime. So, so that's sort of the other thing. I agree with you. I think you, you buy, you look at real goods right now um, and you look at these places that are sort of benefiting from the debt-based economy, which is, you know, you know real estate, you know, even certain stocks will, will benefit from that where you can essentially borrow money close to zero and, invest in, you know, businesses that are, you know, essentially a, a achieving a spread above that. So I think there's probably some stocks that will do okay. But yeah, I, I agree with you in general. The other nice thing about real assets is typically they don't have the moral baggage as much. Uh, you know, if you have gold, it doesn't have any, the moral baggage is like investing in uh, maybe a mutual fund that also invests that, that one of their companies is Playboy or something like that. So that's nice about it too. Uh, you know, the, the mortgage issue is an interesting one because for most of my adult life, I have been very much as anti-debt as, as anybody can imagine. And the idea of owning my home outright was like the number one financial priority for me. Um, and, and, I've all, and I advise my kids the same thing. But I will admit that in, in the past maybe two or three years, I started to change my opinion about that because of what you just said, the inflationary environment. The fact is money is super cheap right now. And so if you get, a, let's say you just get a mortgage on a hundred thousand dollar house right now, let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Well, in 30 years, that hundred thousand dollars is a lot less than it's worth a lot less. And yet you got it now instead of, and you, you can pay off over time. And so really, and, and, and especially with interest rates being 
four percent, something like that. If inflation is seven percent, that actually works out in your favor a lot in that situation. Now, I would, and so like I, I'm less adamant about uh, paying off the house as as well, just because of of this environment we're in. Now, I would say, I, I think I assume you'd agree with this. Like prud prudentially, no matter what, your your uh, loan to value ratio shouldn't be crazy. So you don't. Uh, if it's and, and also compared to what you, you make, you don't get a if you're making fifty thousand dollars a year as a family, you don't get a five hundred thousand dollar house with a four hundred and fifty or four hundred seventy five thousand dollar mortgage on it. If you can get away, you don't do that because all that has to happen is your specific area, the values of real estate goes down and you're underwater, and now you got you got lots of problems. Um, so I mean, obviously, I, I would think that would agreed. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, I mean, so even with the, the rates being low, the the sort of perverse incentive is you're, you're going to try to squeeze yourself into the biggest house possible because maybe that's possible with rates ring, being low. But but with prudence, um, you know, I think that's probably unwise. You should still look to follow. You know, my advice is always borrow less than what the bank will lend. Um, you know, there's some rules of thumb, like keep your um, keep your payments under 20 percent of your gross income. And if you want to be you know, something like a single family household, you should look at one income. Right. Instead of two incomes. Or like, uh, you know, something like three times your income is, is the most you should ever look to borrow. And oftentimes, if you do that, it's going to be less than the bank will lend. Whereas the sort of incentive or the, um, you know, the, the FOMO reaction right now is to try to borrow as much as you can to, to, to quick squeeze yourself into the biggest house possible before inflation makes that um, not, not a possibility. And, um, and I think you can, you can pump the brakes on that if you're, if you're trying to be prudent about it. Uh, so are you a fan of Dave, Dave Ramsey? Of course. Yeah. I think Dave Ramsey's great. And I know Kennedy Hall brought him up on uh, one, one of your prior podcasts. Yeah, right. It's uh, you know, it's sort of become like a cottage industry in the financial advice space to like critique Dave Ramsey and to like poke holes in what he's doing. But I think in general um, the idea that he motivates people to take ownership of their money and to be intentional about what they're doing. And he, he has a right to be skeptical of debt. Um, However, like, I just think, um, I don't, I think, you know, especially in the inflationary environment, it does make sense. And, you know, you brought up usury, like, like I, I have a young family, we've got two kids and, and, and one on the way. And like, we, it's frankly, it just fits, like, it's nice for us to be able to have a, have a house right now, even though I bought the house when I was single and I wouldn't have been able to buy the home without borrowing that money. And so to me, like, it's, it's, it's actually just that the bank is charging me a rate of interest because I value that house today more than I value it, you know, by waiting a couple of decades to finally save up the money and, and, and own it free and clear. And so um, I, I love Dave Ramsey. I think he does great work, but I, I, um, I yeah, I still, that's kind of how I feel about this whole paying off the mortgage thing right now. Yeah. And also to make sure something's clear, I'm Adam, I'm personally at least adamantly against uh, consumer debt. So yeah. only debt on real assets, like right. a, a mortgage on a house, not credit card debt to go out to go on a vacation or something like that. That uh, to me, that's anathema. I just don't see any financial like prudence in that. And I think I think it even starts going into immoral territory, uh, depending on how much somebody would abuse that. Agreed. Uh, OK, so. I, I said I wasn't really going to talk about a lot, but I do want to talk about Bitcoin at least a little bit because okay. I can't have a financial economic discussion on my podcast without some discussion of Bitcoin. Amen. So I can tell, you know, I would guess you're, what, what's your official thing? You're a certified financial planner. How many certified financial planners would you guess are pro Bitcoin? Like just percentage wise ballpark. It's probably under 20 percent um, okay. and it's it's gone up as the price has gone up and Bitcoin has um, achieved a level of credibility and sort of like traditional finance. So like, you know, fidelity, like good old fidelity, like one of the largest financial institutions is now like a, a, an advocate of Bitcoin, but it's still very low um, for a number of reasons. But yeah, it's, it's uh, I, I am sort of like a, a heretic in that sense. Now, do you recommend Bitcoin actually to your clients? I do. do. Yeah, I do okay. with, with, with all the caveats. So, right. um, yeah. So like I, I recommend Bitcoin to clients. Um, like we, we sort of view it not so much as an inflation hedge in that like, you know, Wall Street's just going to think it's like gold right now. Like I don't think that's where Bitcoin is at. But essentially we, we view it as like what could potentially 
become the base money of the future. And so it's essentially an invention that sort of solves some of these problems that we're talking about where um, the princes are allowed to clip the coins right now, whereas with Bitcoin, that's impossible. So what are the caveats that you that you tell people, clients when they when you are talking about Bitcoin? Yeah. And so I think, um, you know, the first step with, with Bitcoin is obviously you just have to educate yourself um, and and you have to come to a certain level of conviction. And so like with my view, like, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be skeptical about markets right now. Um, there's a lot of, you know, people that are my age have like never really seen a bear market. And so um, like my view is like th the answer to that is you have to own things that you're optimistic about over the long run, because there's a chance that, you know, we could be in a pretty bad way in, in conventional markets in the near future. And so, you know, with something like Bitcoin, the way to to handle that, the way to handle the volatility is that you're long term optimistic about that buy and hold. And so, um, you know, I, I tell all of my clients, like I, I can try to educate you. I can try to, you know, t help you understand, like why we're owning this in portfolios. But of course, at the end of the day, it's your money. And if you don't have conviction about it, like that's totally understandable. In fact, like Andy Flattery does not have all the answers. I'm trying to do the best that I can. And I think I'm coming from this from a, a good place. But but that's sort of, sort of how I think about it. And so so where we're at today, like we kind of view um, Bitcoin as like the alternative bucket. And so um, I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, the, the convention for those financial planners that are talking about it, the way they handle it is like you should have a one percent allocation. And, and the way that that I think about that is it's not really it's not a bad idea. You probably should have a one percent allocation. However, like I sort of think that's a bit of a cop out because it's sort of like saying, if, if it works out, like I want to be able to say I recommended it. However, if it doesn't work out, like it's no skin off my nose as someone that's recommending it. And so like I, I like to have a little bit of skin in the game. So anyway, we have anywhere from a, a 5% to a, you know, maybe a 20% allocation right off the bat. Um, depending on your level of conviction, you could maybe have a higher allocation than that. And then I think the way to think about it is maybe just um, don't do like a traditional rebalancing strategy with something like this where you know so with bitcoin it, it goes sort of in fits and spurts so if it does end up working out really well well you you want to sort of be able to benefit from that you know short period of time where it has sort of exponential growth and so what i would say with that is maybe you don't do like you know some sort of quantitative systematic rebalancing with something like that you just benefit from these like short fits and spurts where it appreciates what do you think eric yeah. Hey, I'm not the financial planner. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been a big Bitcoin advocate for, for years since 2013. Uh, and I, I do think, I mean, I remember hearing somebody say the 1% rule. And I think for somebody, the, 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 the argument was essentially this. If you put 1% of your, your worth into, into Bitcoin and it goes to zero, it's not going to materially affect your life. Right. I'm, we're talking about people who have money to invest, by the way. Not we're not talking about somebody who's struggling, you know, paycheck to paycheck, something like that. But, but if Bitcoin does what I think you and I both think it's going to do, that one percent will make will, will make a material difference in your life when it go, if it goes up because it won't be one percent of your your portfolio anymore. And so I think that's the reason why. Now you could say that almost about anything, though. You could say it about Beanie Babies, you know. You could say mm -hmm. it about whatever. But I think for me at least, Bitcoin has proven itself. Because of the fact that it addresses all the problems we were talking about before, like you said, that it's actually an alternative to fiat cur currency and the problems that are, that are happening there. The whole thing we're talking about how it's not a free market of money. Well, here's a free market of money. Uh, I do think there are definitely concerns with the fact that the, the governments are very much uh, uh, working on the on ramps and the off ramps. Yeah. Like I, I heard in um, Europe, there was a, uh, they were trying to pass a law in the European Union where your hardware wallet, which is for those who aren't real up on this stuff, it's it's the where you hold your Bitcoin that's not at any third party. You actually hold it in a device. This is like not the technical terms, but we'll just use them anyway on, of your own, almost like it's, it, it, but it's at your, in your hand, so to speak. Um, but they're making it where if you send from that to like an exchange, then the exchange is required to ask you exactly the, all the financial information, the, the KYC, the know your customer, the, the name, the address, the social of where of the person who owns that hardware wallet. Well, the whole point of hardware wallet was you don't nobody knows what, what's in there or anything like that. But that would give it the, all away. So I am concerned about that. The, the, the ability for Bitcoin to kind of overcome that long term. Um, I, I think it will. But I think that's those are challenges for it. Definitely. Uh, I, I, 
you know, it's funny for years, I would just tell people, I'm not telling you what to do with your money. And I remember my sister got all mad at me when Bitcoin went up high. She's like, why didn't you tell me to invest? I'm like, I wrote a book about it. You should have just figured yeah. it out on your own. But, and so it's like, you know, people have to do what they can. But I, I think I, I personally would go, I, I go higher than 1% myself, but I, I understand the the reasoning behind the 1% advice rule, because I do think it's something that it, it has the legitimate potential, not, not the, the guarantee, but the legitimate potential to go up exponentially. And there's very few things you can say. You can't say about PNG. You can't say that about gold. You can't say that about uh, even real estate has certain caps on what, because people just can't afford after a while. I mean, right. um, so whereas Bitcoin, there's almost no ceiling to it like there is um, with everything else. So that's why I'm like, yeah, putting a little bit into it. Um, but like you said, know what you're doing, understand it, have conviction. Yeah, I mean, I, the, other, the other consideration there, otherwise. The other consideration there is, of course, like de depending on who you are, like um, is going to, you know, be a useful uh, decision, you know, be, be useful kind of um, uh, part of like who, how you're going to allocate this. So like in the case of your mother, um, your mother's never going to work again. Um, she's probably living on, you know, uh, her Attention. savings right now. Yeah. And so obviously like that allocation is going to be a lot less than, um, you know, somebody that like it's the first job out of college. They've got some extra money to save and invest where someone like that could have a really high allocation because, you know, the ultimate goal for someone that's just starting out is to have, you know, a decent amount of wealth that they can provide for their, their family and their generations with. And so obviously someone like that can have a very high allocation when they're just getting started because they can keep making more money, um, which is a nice thing to have when you're owning something like Bitcoin, which is extremely volatile because when it goes down, goes down, you might want to buy some more. Right, um, right. Yeah. It's funny you say that because my mom, she was she was always begging me to she wanted to own some Bitcoin because she knew, of course, I had talked about it. She yeah. she'd seen my book and everything. So finally, I, I got a little bit of for her on an exchange. And so she she can actually tell her friends she owns Bitcoin. I think it's like one hundred dollars worth or something like that. But, yeah. but she can say she owns Bitcoin now. So uh, but yeah, it, it'd be like I have told her this multiple times. So like it just is not wise for you in, the, in your situation to own, even though I believe in Bitcoin long term. I know like three years from now, it could be worth 10% of what it is now. Mm -hmm. And for somebody in that situation who might have like serious medical bills or nursing home bills, whatever, or whatever the case may be in, in the, at that time frame, can't risk that. But like you said, a college, somebody just getting out of college. Yeah. I mean, you could, you have a higher risk, uh, uh, yeah. factor at that point. Well, you, I mean, you bring up my, my sort of traditional finance background. So I've worked in finance, finance since 2010. And so that means like, I, I have had to rewire my sort of Keynesian thinking on a lot of things. And so I was later to come to Bitcoin than a lot of people like you were. And because uh, I was, you know, like a lot of people, I was a skeptic for, for, for a very long time. Like I sort of thought of it as like too good to be true or I sort of thought about it as just like this sort of speculative frenzy and everyone was just obsessed with the number grow up, but there was not like a lot of meat on the bone. And a couple of things really changed my mind on that. Well, Eric, you did. I remember you saying something like, I'm interested in the, in the cryptocurrencies that are specifically looking to fix money itself. And so I thought that was sort of an interesting way of framing it. Cause like in sort of this whole cryptocurrency ecosystem, there's like a lot of different messages, but I thought that was interesting that you said that. And then I also discovered the hodlers, which are essentially the Bitcoin holders that are the hodl stands for hold on for dear life. And they're treating it as like a savings technology. So they're not, trying to trade it. They're not trying to like make a leverage bet when it's low and so that they can sell it at the top and like make a huge killing, which is what you see in a lot of this space. In fact, they're just literally buying it and they're stacking it like, like it's gold in their safe. And so when I discovered that there's like a percentage of this market where the hodling exists and some people call it like the, um, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, the buyers of last resort. Essentially, no one's ever going to bail out Bitcoin. And so what you need is you need these buyers of last resort, the, the people that will never sell and the people that will buy when we have these wipeouts. And so when I discovered that actually is a large part of the Bitcoin ethos, it really excited me because I think it kind of, in theory, it could get us back to this idea of like saving good money and then like investing can become more of like an intentional thing for certain people that have an expertise in their unique areas. Yeah. I, and that, and I think that's something, an argument from like a Catholic perspective mm -hmm. about for Bitcoin is that our current fiat 
system is is quite literally geared to for consumerism. The whole point of Keynesian economics yeah. is spin, spin, spin. And that to me is antithetical to Catholicism, which is much more based upon that you're prudent, you support your family, you support those around you, you support your community, you give to those in need. And so you have to be financially more conservative, more reserved. You're not going out and buying yachts and things like that. Whereas Bitcoin, the way it's made, it, it encourages you to save. And saving is a good thing for any economy. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that saving is also very good for even from a micro level for a family that if there's a, a problem down the road, you can support, you know, like when your kids get sick with something and you, you can't, your health insurance isn't covered, you have some money for it. You know, whatever the case, maybe it's like a, a family member loses their job. You can help support your family, your, your, maybe your brother-in-law, something like that. Obviously, uh, helping the poor, all those things by saving the money you're in a financially strong position that you can help those in need. Whereas if you're going out and spending it on vacations and, and shoes and all this stuff, I don't see how that's, that, that's, but that's exactly what they want you to do. I don't see how that's Catholic. So I think that's, that's, that'll be my pitch for Bitcoin for Catholics right there. Um, but I want to ask one last question because we're kind of running out of time here. I just want, give me your, what you foresee just generally over the next five to 10 years with the economy. Cause I know a lot of Catholics, a lot of non-Catholics, everybody very worried. The future looks bleak to a lot of people. And I admit it looks bleak to me. I just want to hear from your perspective because you're much more in tune with what's going on in the economy. What do you see as the most likely scenarios uh, happening in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I, I, um, I was really impacted by a guy named Chris Mayer who wrote a book called hundred baggers, which was, um, was really impactful on me. And, and the way that Chris Mayer handles these questions, the book, Hundred Baggers, he goes through the history of the stock market and all of the hundred X returns that have happened in the stock market uh, by people owning individual businesses through a long period of time. And essentially they turn a dollar into a hundred over many years. And he, he, he starts to tell the story of like, who are these businesses and how, how is this possible in these, these certain businesses? Um, I have a friend who experienced this with uh, Warren Buffett, my friend, Ryan O'Connor here in Kansas City, um, grew up in Omaha and his grandfather was a friend of Warren Buffett in the 1950s. And he was an early investor in Buffett and he invested his life savings in Buffett's fund. He held it over many decades through various, um, you know, the 1970s of stagflation, um, 2008 financial crisis. And he, he became very wealthy and he set um, something like over 60 to 70 grandchildren to Catholic University with the profits that he earned in his uh, Berkshire Hathaway shares. And so I tell that story not to, um, you know, pitch you know, Berkshire Hathaway or something like that. And of course, Warren Buffett has his own issues. But to point out that uh, what Chris Mayer points out is like, I, I don't try to be a macro economist. Um, I don't try to figure out how the machinations of the Federal Reserve are going to impact commodity prices in Russia, um, because I don't think I am suited to do that. There are plenty of people out there that are doing that, that I follow. Um, and uh, so, so the way that I handle that is on the micro level. Um, I work on my own business and I like to invest in individual businesses and make the owner operators deal with the macro environment. OK, and so. That's how I handle it. And so in the case of Berkshire Hathaway, if you um, were worried about the stagflation of the 1970s, if you were worried about the, the, the big spending of the, uh, you know, the 1980s under Reagan or you know, the fact that Bill Clinton was the president in the 1990s, right? Like you, you might have been um, someone that wanted to sell their stocks if you didn't like Bill Clinton. Of course, that's what a lot of folks do is they sell their stocks when they don't like the president. Um, however, if you bet on somebody that you believe in, like in the case of my buddy, Ryan O'Connor, Warren Buffett, you, you let Buffett deal with that by owning his businesses. And so I do that with the businesses that I own. I, I invest in owner operators um, and I, and I want to let the, the, the founders of these businesses deal with that macro environment and how they allocate capital in their own businesses. And then you hold the stock and, and you deal with um, you deal with it um, come what may. And so. Um, you know, Bitcoin is another example of that, too. But I sort of think that's how you that's how I like to handle it in the stock market. Um, you know, other than that, like I still think having diversification is useful. Um, you know, we talked about things like like gold and silver, like those will do really well in sort of like a deflationary. I'm, I'm sorry, like a, a inflationary environment. Um, and then having, of course, a little bit of cash works really, really well, too. 
because in a debt-based fiat economy, you do have these deflationary busts where um, you get asset prices that spiral and you might want to buy things cheaply. And so that's sort of how I handle that question as opposed to trying to being like the macro, the macro guy. So you're essentially what you're doing is you're putting your money with people you trust um, or at least institutions or in the case of Bitcoin, a computer program. <laughs> uh, but you're basically just saying that and like you trust that they are going to be able to navigate in their own little sphere whatever's going on in the in the big sphere yeah i mean like elon musk like he's kind of a cronyist right um right. and so like i've been skeptical of elon musk but he also like does some things that i like like he uh you know he says sometimes he says some things on twitter like i'm like oh, okay maybe this guy kind of gets it and so i don't invest in tesla um i don't I, you know i don't exactly know everything about elon musk but i'm sort of skeptical of him of him but let's say that you like elon musk like you know something about him and you believe in what he's doing you're a fan of like the the technology um, that Tesla is is promoting. Well, maybe you buy shares in his business because that's that's the richest man in the world, and he's got most of his net worth in that stock. So essentially, the, the way that you handle that is you invest in someone that has skin in the game, and then you let Elon figure out the macro environment. Which right. you know, in his case, means that he's sort of an innovator, but he's sort of a cronyist. So I think there's some problems with that. But um, you know, there might be somebody listening to this that's a fan of Elon. Right, right, exactly. Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap it up there. I, I appreciate this, and hopefully it was helpful for our listeners just kind of thinking about these subjects as a Catholic, uh, because I think a lot of times you, as Catholics, we might go to a, some financial person, and we don't necessarily trust that they're going to have a, a kind of Catholic perspective. That's why I wanted to bring you on, so nice. I really appreciate that. So, And I will put a link to your website on there. I know I think you only work with people in, in your area, though, right? Correct? Yeah, no, with the miracle of technology, I work with people all over. Oh, um, good. And so that's uh, sort of a beautiful thing that um, this has allowed me to do with the podcast and uh, and the internet is that I, can, I work with people all over. So Okay, good. Okay, good. Well, I'll definitely put a link to it. And of course, the the reform, not Calvinist reform, the reform yeah. financial advisor podcast. I also put a link to that to make sure people can listen to it. I was a guest on it a few months ago, so uh, I highly recommend it. So, okay, thanks, Andy. I appreciate it. And until next time, everybody, God love you. Thanks, Eric.